turn this around here. This is something that you'll rarely see for several reasons. Number one, this is a cartilage tumor here. This used to be the bone, the cortex of the bone, but this cartilage tumor is not behaving in a friendly manner. Look at it. It is destroying the bone, destroying the cortex, invading aggressively into the soft tissue outside of the bone. Obvious invasion. This is a really perfect section here, cut very nicely by some awesome histotechs. And when you look in the bone itself, you can see this is normal bone here, right? Or it used to be. It's got lamellar bone lines, right? So when you see lamellar bone with the little bone lines there that are all parallel, you know that that is either, it's either cortex or trabecular bone that's normal. It's not being produced by the tumor. When tumors make bone, they make woven bone, okay? Maybe it can mature eventually, but when, when a tumor starts out making bone, new bone is woven bone. Um, and in here we have this island of bone completely surrounded by cartilage tumor. And the cartilage tumor also has, look at all the necrosis, tons of single cell necrosis. I'm not 100% sure if that always means malignancy, but I am very worried when I see individual chondrocyte necrosis to any extent in a cartilage lesion, because when I've seen that before, usually on a larger sample, those ended up being chondrosarcoma. So I get very worried when I start seeing obviously necrotic chondrocytes, all right? I don't make a definitive diagnosis of malignancy based on that alone, but on a small biopsy, that's a feature that concerns me. We also have extensive mixoid change to the matrix here. All the bone is being completely permeated. This is a perfect example to burn in your mind of what permeative growth looks like. The problem, of course, is yes, it's easy to see it here because this is an amputation specimen. So we can take a huge slab of bone and the adjacent tissue and see everything. When you don't have a, set, a specimen like this and you just get some curette or a needle biopsy, it's much harder or it's impossible, like I said. And that's when you really have to work closely with your radiology colleagues. And also remember that just as pathologists, some pathologists have a lot of expertise in bone and soft tissue tumors, and some have very little experience. The same is true for radiologists. Just because they look at bones, um, uh, all of them have training in bones, doesn't mean that all of them have seen a lot of bone tumors or soft tissue tumors, because those tumors are rare for us and for radiologists. So if you have the, the privilege of working with or near a musculoskeletal radiologist, someone who's done a musculoskeletal radiology fellowship, that can be priceless. And in really hard cases, sometimes I've always been lucky to have one or more awesome MSK radiologists work with me where I can consult them on cases if, if they're difficult. But if you don't have that, see if you can get the imaging study sent out to be reviewed by an expert, because that can also be helpful, just like getting the pathology reviewed by an expert. So just keep that in mind. And if you don't have a close relationship with your radiologist, fix that. Because I can't tell you how many times my radiologists have really helped me on a hard case, either saved me from making a mistake or helped me to see a nuance that helped me put the pieces together and figure out the right diagnosis for the patient. So I, I rely very heavily on them, especially in bone pathology. Do not do bone pathology without radiology support. You have to at least have a radiology report um, available to you or ideally um, be able to see the images yourself. And if you can't, then you really are limited in the amount of information you can provide. And if I have a case where I really just cannot get that information, which is extremely rare, but I've had that before with some consults in the past. And there are times where I'll say, well, here's what I see, but I really don't know what to make sense of this because I don't have any radiology information. So um, in any case, I've not had to do anything like that for a long time. The other thing here is look at the cellularity. This is very cellular and the cells are enlarged and atypical and they're kind of spindle. So I know we saw some areas that look kind of like this in that last cartilage case, but again, in a small benign uh, growth pattern lesion in the small bones of the hands and feet, totally fine to see stuff like this. In a long bone, that's atypical, but here we actually are in the foot. I forgot to tell you that this is in the foot. So even though if I just had this in the middle of the bone and it was benign in its growth pattern, I'd be okay with areas, even though that looks really weird. But once I see it permeating through the normal bone, destroying the cortex, invading the soft tissue, this is chondrosarcoma. Doesn't matter if we're in the foot or the hand. This is definitely chondrosarcoma here. And this is the, one of the only times I've ever seen chondrosarcoma and epidermis on the same slide because this was extending so far out of the bone that the section actually was able to see skin all the way down to bone. Pretty unbelievable, very unfortunate case this patient lost their foot. This was uh, some years ago, uh, and I'm not sure what the final outcome was, but I hope that the patient did well. All right, so this is a good example of chondrosarcoma. I would, uh, personally on this, I would probably call it grade two. I think the grading of chondrosarcomas is, is somewhat subjective, 
But um, once I start seeing stuff that looks pretty atypical, cellular spindled, then I would call it grade two. Grade one to me, uh, well, you can go read the new WHO. It's kind of complicated, and I think that it's and they've changed a lot of things. And so I would, uh, it's too much to go into in this video. But in any case, I would call this a grade two chondrosarcoma. I think that's actually what it did call this, if I recall. And let me show you now some uh, very dramatic gross images. This is a really uh, great section. I think we froze the foot, if I recall, in this case, in a, in a minus 80 freezer. Um, if you're lucky and have like a diamond tip saw, you can uh, cut and not have to do that. But I feel like you have a band saw. Freezing um, seems to work really well. I used to be really worried about doing that. I was afraid it would like cause freezing artifact in the cytology. But um, over time, I've been re really convinced if you freeze it rapidly in, in a minus 80, um, you'll, you can cut right through it with a bandsaw and the histology usually comes out beautifully afterwards. So you can see here, the I can't remember which actual bone in here it was arising from, but it's completely destroyed the bone bulged all the way out in the soft tissue, growing in between the other bones. There was no way, unfortunately, to extract this tumor without removing the foot. And here's another view closer in to see the uh, different bones in the ankle. And then one final view. You can see the glistening uh, appearance and the multilobulation that's very typical of cartilaginous uh, tumors. So again, I've only seen a few of those over time. So they're very rare, but they do happen.